Professor Thomas Triber. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived for Inside Boxing Weekly. So here are your hosts, Mike Goodpaster, John Einreinhofer, and Jeremiah Pricer on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Weekly is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Uh, if you want to get a little bonus, you can go in at mybookie.ag, use the promo code TGT50, or you can go to the gruelingtruth.net website and click on the banner at the top of the page. We are also brought to you by Seat Giant, which is promo code LEGEND when you go to the Seat Giant website, and also by the Retired Boxers Foundation, Alex Ramos, Jackie Richardson, do a great job there. Make sure you check them out on Facebook. I am your co-host for Inside Boxing <clears throat> Weekly, Mike Goodpasser. And right now, I would like to welcome Jeremiah Pricer. Oh, my God. A, another fantastic weekend of boxing. Dude, I'm super stoked. Let's let's get this going, man. All right. I don't know if you're sarcastic or not, because there actually were a couple decent fights. Um and that makes for a great week from now on. Um, so help me welcome in also John Einreinhofer. How you doing, John? Good, Mike. Yeah, there, there were you know there were a couple of good fights, and there was a lot of quantity this weekend. That's for sure. So uh, there's there's uh, there's quantity to discuss. All right. I don't think we're going to discuss all the quantity, but let's go with the stuff that's quality. Um, and not that the first was quality. But I think it's worth talking about. Me and Jeremiah talked about it a little bit Friday night. Dana Dubois with the second round knockout over Razvan Kajanu. Jeremiah, what do you think of this one? I, I thought Dubois did what we were hoping he would do. He would go out and make a statement and make sure that the guy got out of there. And I was pretty impressed. I mean, you know, he like John said, he he does look a little slow. But, you know, the guy seems to have big power. Uh, he's a bit sprightly because of his age. You know, Kajanu is a guy who's extended Joseph Parker the distance. Uh, you know, Parker obviously has not turned out to be much of a puncher, but, you know, it still says a little bit something when you can extend a guy the full distance. And, and it just typically shows you got a little game and ship to you. But no, nah, Dubois went out there and, and got it done. I mean, Kajanu, I, I thought, was pretty dumb in, in his display. I mean, he was trying to counterpunch off the ropes, and he just got blasted and laid out. All right, um, John, any more impressed than you ever were with Kajanu with the quick uh, extinction of Kajanu when some guys that are ranked much higher have had a hard time getting rid of him? Well, you know, Kajanu did get taken out early by Donovan Dennis, but as pointed out by Jeremiah, you know, Kajanu did go recently the distance with Parker. I think, you know, Dubois' power looked good. The part that was impressive in terms of the guy's got to do the job with what's in front of him and uh, his dispatching of Kojanu was similar to Luis Ortiz. So that, that was the positive. The negative for me was he, he looks, he looks slow to me. He, he's been looking slow and he looks slow. And, uh, you know, for a guy, now he's very young for a heavyweight coming up, especially, but you wouldn't expect, with him being very young, that he would be slow. So I see that being a possible problem down the line, but he he did what he had to do Friday night. uh, That's that's what you got to do to stay on the radar screen and keep making your case and getting the guy out of there with a huge knockout in two rounds. He, Dubois, you know, got it done. They can throw him in with Joyce. He'd kill Joyce. Yeah, I, I was thinking that a little bit. That, well, you know, I mean, you know, just in terms of their hand speed, I mean, it, it'd be wild, like watching two sloths duke it out. But, yeah, you but know, the difference it'd be fun. is this. Dubois does throw straight punches, and I don't know that Joyce does, does he? He looks like I, he's got more power than Joyce, but, but Joyce is aggressive and throws a lot. It, you know, I, I don't know what the politics of it. You know, if it ever could happen, but it, it really wouldn't be a, a bad fight. You know, that's the problem again with boxing. You you wish you could just get something like this. You know, let let one guy move forward and the other guy take a temporary step back if they're both undefeated. It's yeah, not going to happen. But yeah, it wouldn't and be a good we, matchup. Yeah, and I just want to say we could. You there, Jeremiah? Oh well, never mind. Sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. What'd you say? 
Oh, okay. Now I was just going to say we could throw Nathan Gorman on that card, too. and Just have all three of them fight each other. I think Dubois would be... The well, that, that was the disappointing... Yeah, that was the disappointing thing was that there seemed, and as we know, these are the problems with boxing, there seemed to be serious talk about two weeks ago that Dubois, you know, takes out Gujanu, who Gorman had just fought, and Dubois and Gorman were going to fight next, and then you watch the broadcast Friday night, and after Dubois gets the big knockout, they've got Frank Warren on there, and Frank Warren is saying openly in the interview that Gorman and Dubois has to marinate more. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, we well, got guys to me, do you think maybe the Dubois marinated. looked better than what they expected? Maybe, maybe, because, yeah, that was a, all of a sudden Frank Warren had completely changed his tune, and, and he's saying right on the interview, so it's coming right out of his mouth, that uh, it has to marinate more, and that's not that won't be happening next. So that's boxing in 2019. All right, next up, Liam Williams fought. And then after that, um, let's see. <laughs> I'm not really too worried about that fight. We'll go to Juan Carlos Payano who won a unanimous eight-round eight decision over Damian Vasquez. What's your take on Payano here, Jeremiah? Well, uh, <clears throat> Payano is a good fighter. I mean, I, I've always thought that he was quality. I mean, he got quick hands. He had a strong amateur background. And his combination punching is pretty good. I know he got wiped out by Inua, but, you know, he's shown some world-class uh, talent, you know, when he was fighting Rashi Warren, uh, you know, he moved up quickly, which isn't something you always see from guys uh, who come from the Dominican Republic. So I think he's a pretty good fighter. I mean, he's a, he's about a lower top 10 level guy to me. But, you know, of course, 118 has gotten pretty good in recent years. So he might not even be that at this point. Uh, but he's a good fighter. Again, you know, because of his lack of power, though, he's going to he's gonna have a tough time. But then again, a lot of guys in that division have a lack of power. So, you know, that means he can sustain for a little while. But, uh, I mean, I don't see him beating any of the best guys. I mean, he's already shown that he can't beat arguably the best guy at 118. So, you know, he, he'll, he'll probably earn another decent shot at a, at a good fighter. But, he, he's again, he's never going to be on the top rung of the ladder. I agree completely. John? Yeah, uh, one thing I want to give props, because there were a couple of these like this, and, and the three of us have talked in recent weeks, and there has been some response from people listening, that you know, too many of these fights are just, you know, one guy's a minus 1,400 favorite or a minus 2,000 favorite. PBC did have some undercard fights this weekend that were close on the odds, and one of them was Piano and Vasquez. Now, Piano ended up dominating the fight, uh, Credit to him for getting it done. I thought Piano was just kind of Piano. He he looked to me like he always does. And and I'm not you know trying to pick on the youngster, but you know we we got a job to to call call it as we see it. And I think you have to s- s- say it after seeing Vasquez fight Piano Saturday night. Obviously, people were making a statement afterward he wasn't ready, but it was beyond him not being ready. He just was not good. He didn't show any offense whatsoever. Uh, Piano, not a puncher like Jeremiah mentioned, and he was, he was throwing his usual looping shots, and he's got a low KO percentage. He almost had Vasquez out of it. Um, I wonder, after you see this, was this actually one of these things behind the scenes where they see him every day and privately, privately they were saying, you know, he's not real. This happens sometimes. You know, he's not going anywhere. So we'll throw him in with Piano now and just, you know, see, see what happens and hope we, we roll a seven somehow because this guy's not going anywhere. But, uh, you know, people were saying, well, he wasn't really ready and we'll see uh, how, the, how the kid does after this. I, I didn't see. I don't know, you know, what Jeremiah thought on that. I didn't see anything. I mean, did you see, did you see well, anything from him in that nobody fight? Nobody saw anything. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, well, I mean, I can comment a little bit about – yeah, well, I mean, I can comment a little bit about this because the guy is from Colorado, and I will say that as handlers, they did a pretty good job of getting him paid pretty well for a Colorado fighter. I mean, there's there's a general lack of talent here. You know, it's it's one of those to do states, and and often guy, it's it's just few and far in between. You actually get guys with real legitimate talent, and and sometimes they don't even 
uh, enter into the pros. I mean, I remember we had a, a rock solid amateur who was very close to, I think, getting into the Olympic trials and ended up uh, losing a tiebreaker round or something real close. And I know he was a small guy as well. And he ended up giving it up and, you know, just dealing with the family life. And but you look at Vasquez's record and there was just nobody of note on, on there. And, uh, you know, I had seen from, uh, I got a couple buddies who used to be Colorado promoters and, you know, are still involved in the Colorado boxing community. And, you know, they said that the kid was good, but, you know, good for Colorado. I mean, so I don't think he's ever going to amount to anything on the world level. Uh, again, he had nobody on his resume. And I, I just don't think he's ever going to, uh, again, be, be a contender type, even a fringe contender type. So, yeah, what this would be like then, from what I hear, John, would be, you know, the West Virginia State Basketball Tournament, you think your team's real good, you're in a small community, and you kick everybody's ass, and you go to the regionals, and then you play a team from the big city, and you lose by 70. And then everybody wonders, what the hell happened? Yeah, it can happen. Yep. Except, except, when, except when they had the team Why? with O.J. Mayo and, and Patrick Patterson on the same team, and they <laughs> started whipping to bats and showed how overrated all those coaches were. But oh. that's that's the exception, not the norm. All right. But... Um, but I think Jeremiah added a lot of good insight there because, yeah, it is one of those types of things. Sure, when you're in a certain regional level that because of the population or the tradition in that sport or whatever is not, you know, that difficult. Yeah, when you when you move on to face tougher, tougher opposition, you know, you can you can certainly get exposed and get a reality check. And I think Jeremiah provided some excellent insight uh, for what happened there Saturday night. All right, then next up, Roberto Guerrero fought. That was exciting. And then Francisco Santana lost to Abel Ramos in a 10-round unanimous decision. This was a solid fight, and I know it's one you wanted to talk about, John. Yeah, just because uh, it was a guy, you know, not on top 10 level, but Ramos has been in with some good guys, and and, uh, Santana just upset Felix Diaz, who was a top 10 level guy. So they've been in with guys like that. But, uh, you know, again, even – not even, but very close on the odds going in. Um, Ramos was actually the slight underdog, and he got dropped early, but he rallied and almost got Santana out of there. So, you know, that was one that was a little bit of a risk because of the players being lesser known, but ended up playing out well uh, on national TV, because that's what I'm in favor of. I mean, if you're going to put something on national TV, I'd rather have lesser known guys put on a good fight than supposedly well-known guys who are two minus 2,000 underdogs just, you know, blowing away no hopers. So I thought that ended up working out pretty well. And, and Ramos does have some offensive skills. He gave Brancheck all he could handle a couple of years ago. That's where he really got on my radar screen. He did lose the fight, but he had dropped him, and it was a war. It was a complete war. So he, I think Ramos might have a future. I don't know how far he goes, but he's not somebody to discount. All right, Jeremiah, you like Ramos? Yeah, I mean, he's he's fun. I mean, he, you know, he again, kind of like uh, Piano. I, I don't think he's ever going to be a real top level player, but so long as you match these guys right, I honestly don't care. I mean, much of boxing is not about being a top player. I mean, when you look at the middleweight division just by itself, and there's almost fifteen hundred guys competing amongst one another, yeah, yeah, you, you have to understand that. I mean, oftentimes we like to talk, you know, a, a just about the very top guys, and that, that's all good and well. But again, much of what makes up the sport are these these journeymen and, and low level type guys that i mean they're they're just a lot of layers on top of the game itself and i, I like what i see out of ramos and i did watch the Berenchek fight as well and, and funny enough i actually got my name called out on thompson boxing promotion last night because i mentioned like alongside uh tara shellistook uh who was also on the team with Berenchek. but uh yeah round ramos is fun i mean he's a good fighter and you know, it's it's good to see him in fun fights like this. And I just hope he, I, I, again, he's not going to beat the, the very best guys in the world, but just keep putting him in fights like this. You know, uh, I mean, it's just fun. You know, it's it's a good way to bolster a card. And uh, he's a good guy to put on the card. I, I just I, I like what I see. He's just a fun guy. All right. Next up, Effie Ajagba. I know you liked him going into this, Jeremiah. It's the first guy he fought that had a pulse. Um, Amon, Amir Mansour. I thought it was impressive again. I thought him and Dubois both did themselves 
I guess you could say, a favor last night. Looked good because they both did what you got to do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, he got him out of there quickly. So I was happy about the... The re- results, I mean, I got to admit that John was high on this guy before I was, uh, you know, I, and so, you know, again, I got to give him credit there. I love Turtle because he's a lot like Dante Wilder, you know, he's tall, he's skinny, he's rangy. There, there, guys, there are guys there are a lot of guys you're, who have long amateur backgrounds. So I like what I see so far, and you can tell that him being you're cutting out really bad. Can you hear me now? It's still cutting out. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yep. Yeah, kinda. You're kind of in a cave, but go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I can't, you know, it's hard to tell where I started to fade away a little bit, but the the guy has good technique for a guy of his region, and I think being in America is really helping him out, and, and he's you know, refining his skills and being brought along nicely. And, you know, the right hand, he was just touching him on with a lot of time committing and falling over himself, you know, stayed poised and he just kept hitting and just never recovered. All right, John, what do you think of Ajagba? Yeah, Ajagba, like you said, Mike, like Dubois, he, he did his job with what was in front of him. I had, I had kind of first liked this fight when it was first signed, but then I had second thoughts about it. I, I didn't, and I had tweeted about that, and I think I probably mentioned it last week. I, I kind of got squeamish about the idea of a 46-year-old guy going against somebody as good as a Jogba on national TV that, that maybe they could have done something else. And that's the way it played out. But, you know, a Jogba, would, would, you know, as Jeremiah was you know alluding to, I like what I've always seen him coming up is, you know, he's one of those guys when, when – and especially at heavyweight, you like to see that when – when he just hits guys, when he just touches guys, you know, th- things start happening. Guys start having weird reactions. And uh, you, you've seen that in every fight he's had, except for when Curtis Harper walked out of the ring because he didn't want to be one of those guys. You know, like Jeremiah said, you know, it, it's early on, so you don't want to get too carried away with it. But you, you do see some attributes that remind you a little bit of a Wilder. And, and sometimes the way he throws the right hand, he reminds you a little bit of a Lennox Lewis. So, the, you know, those are good guys. Uh, as heavyweights to uh, be compared to at this point. And uh, I just hope they keep moving them along quickly. Uh, so, we, you know, because this guy's going to be exciting. I want to see him on national TV, but I, but I just like to, you know, have it with somebody who's got a better chance of hanging in there with him and giving him, trying to give him some resistance and then seeing if he can still unload and get the guys out of there. And uh, I hope they, I hope they bring him back quickly. I'm glad people are getting to know who he is. And, and I think, you know, there are a lot of heavy, young heavyweights to talk about, like, you know, Ajagba, Dubois, uh, you know, you've got Hergovic and, uh, you know, some others coming up. But, you know, J- Joyce should be in some fun fights. So uh, there, there's some interesting stuff coming up. And J- I think Ajagba is the head of the class for me, but we're, we're going to find out how it plays out, obviously. All right. Next up, we had an exciting DAZN card. Um, this started off with Sean Monahan against Callum Johnson. And John, Callum Johnson at least did what he needed to do. And I would really like to know how they, why they keep putting Shawnee Monahan in against guys like this. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, and, and years ago, Jeremiah and I had talked about Monahan, and uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd seen a you know Top Rank had him, and then they they kind of didn't do anything with him, and and when they had their short-lived true TV series, they were putting him on there. And you just could see that he just, he just, I mean, just, he just simply wasn't that good. Um, and not, not trying to get, you know, too hard on the guy, but you, but you could just could see it. You know, he had like some New York 
Golden Gloves background. Uh, he, he turned pro when he was older. You know, that's the thing. I mean, with Monahan, it was when when you saw how he was and he was already older. I thought it. You know, he kept an undefeated record for a long time, fighting a lot of local fights. But it, but it just didn't seem like it was going to go that far. Payday wise, it, it, it was talked about. It seemed a shame that him and Joe Smith never got together uh, and fought on Long Island uh, when it when it mattered, and they were both undefeated. But that's long gone now. That's fifty but, yeah, seconds Monahan... we can't get back to. Well, Monahan, you know, he got blown. Or, or, Get, get to it. He got blown away by uh, Marcus Brown. Then he, he went the distance with Sullivan Barrera. And so going, in, I, I got to say, going into Saturday, I never thought Monahan was that good. But I thought, well, I don't necessarily think Callum Johnson's that good either. He dropped Peter Bev, Bev, but didn't do too much else in there. And Peter Bev had been dropped by a lesser guy before. But that's where I'm going to give Callum, Callum Johnson some props, even though it was. Shawnee Monahan. I mean, he blasted him out, and you can't always go on this, but you pay at least a little bit of attention to it. You know, Monahan tweeted out today that that in all his sparring and his pro fights, uh, and he'd been in there with Barrera and Marcus Brown, that, that that was the hardest he's been tagged. So maybe Callum Johnson really is a puncher. That's what we'll see going going on from here on out. But uh, so it was good for Callum Johnson. But uh, Monahan's talking about retirement, and that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and I think that Callum Johnson is a good, solid fighter, Jeremiah. But I don't think there's any threat of him becoming the light heavyweight champion of the world. And, and what I mean by that is this, and this is for everybody out there under the age of 30, that means that you are the heavy or light heavyweight champion of the world because there could only be one champion of the world, Jeremiah. Yep, we need this more like a boxing Highlander. You know, there could be only one. But, you know, John's assessment of Callum Johnson and, and the, you know, the Monaghan fight is pretty spot on. The, the only thing that I would really add is if, if they want to do something with Callum Johnson, put him in against either Anthony Yarde or another guy that we saw on the weekend, Joe Smith Jr. Uh-huh. I, I, I just think those would... I think those would be fun fights, man. Uh, just, just that's that's my only recommendation. Well, for and him. the thing about that is, I think you would find out just exactly how good Anthony Yard is right away to see if he's actually a threat or not. Yeah, because Johnson's going to come at it, man. I mean, Yard he's a, he's a strong guy, you know. He's, he's muscle bound, and he, again, I, like we talked about on the other show, he's got a good base. I mean, his hand speed's pretty good. His power's pretty good. I like that about him, but you know, it's always it's tough to see how these guys will react. That's why so many of them fall off, you know. And a lot of these guys look like killers early on, and it's you know, it's it's one thing to do that against guys who are going to lay down, but you know, a guy like Johnson who who's going to come get it and who can you know knock your block off. Uh, I think it's a good test, Yarde or, or Joe Smith Jr. I like both of those fights a lot. Oh yeah, especially Joe Smith Callum Johnson. That would be a hell of a fight. But let's go ahead and move on to the Joe Smith fight. Joe Smith gets their, you know, the unanimous decision lost to Dimitri Bivol. The thing that impressed me here, Jeremiah, is this. I think Joe Smith's a good fighter. And I think this. If the light heavyweight championship was determined in an alleyway or a bar, Joe Smith would be the one guy. Unfortunately for him, it's not. But Dimitri Bivol, I didn't think it looked as good as last couple outings. I was impressed with him last night. Yeah, now he's he's going to be a really hard guy to beat. I mean, he's just so technically sharp that it, it it's just. I mean, I don't know what you do with the guy. I mean, you figured you can come right at him. You know, maybe get real aggressive. You know, Smith took some of that appro- uh, approach where he tried to get him. You know, he would throw the jabs out there and whatnot. But it was just light and day between a guy who was a, a master in the amateur program and a guy who's still kind of learning on the job with Joe Smith Jr. I mean, there are a lot of subtle things, you know, that you could pick out the difference with. I mean, you know, Joe Smith was, was by and large, doing a lot of the same things. He wasn't being that creative in in, in trying to get openings. But he was just, he was like a poker player. He was just giving away his hand too much. You know, he would drop his hands or he, you know, he was just doing predictable things. And, you know, Bivol is not the kind of guy to do that stuff with. I mean, you know, there were a few occasions where uh, Smith caught him and, and you could see that he was hurt. But I thought Bivol 
acted professionally. I mean, he, he took it well. You know, well, if, if he had been hurt like uh, – if he had been caught earlier in the, the 11th round, you know, maybe, maybe he wouldn't have seen the, the end, you know, the final bell. But you know, Smith is a genuine puncher. He's got long arms. He's a big guy. But, you know, Bivol is just so sharp in everything he does, and he doesn't give away too much. The problem, the problem fighting him is he closes the distances – you know, whether he's punching, whether he's blocking, whether he's pairing, flipping his head, they're just, the, the guy is really working in fractions. And it's not to say that he's some defensive genius or anything, but he's just so, you know, nuanced and sharp and, and, and he gets his punches back quickly. I mean, he times people well. His punching power is good. I don't think it's great. You know, I, a guy like Smith and I mean, Kovlev, I do think are harder punches. Uh, harder punches than him, but it's just just how sharp he is technically. It's going to be very tough, and and I do like what I've seen out of him. I mean, in this fight, I, I think it's a good performance. I didn't expect him to have Joe Smith Jr. out of there. I mean, Smith is a tough guy. Again, he looked pretty damn big in there, but uh, it, it was a good performance, and, and I, I like what I saw. I mean, I think I did see a little more variety in his shot selection, but I still think if, if there's some place that he's lacking. You know, he, he doesn't seem to have a real killer instinct, but uh, he doesn't go to the body as much as I would like him to. I mean, I think he would service himself well if he would just bang some guys downstairs from time to time. He just headhunts too much. All right. John, what do you think? Yeah, I think it was basically what I expected, except um, as Jeremiah was, was kind of just getting to there, you know, I, I don't actually buy this this stuff about people talking about Bivol that he, he should fight at 168 pounds or he's not that powerful. I just think it's a finishing instinct thing. Uh, he had Joe Smith real hurt at, you know, right at the end of the fight at the 12th, he stopped Barrera very late and Barrera had won some rounds from, him, but, uh, you know, Bivol was winning that fight. Um, you know, I think he, I like Joe Smith. I, I think like Jeremiah said, it, it's, and that's the problem I had with Joe Smith going into this one. It's just the amateur background difference was going to be too much for him here. And it was, but I think that Duvall could have stopped him. I mean, I think he could have just picked it up at different times in the fight. I know Joe Smith is extremely dangerous, but that's the thing when you're with somebody extremely dangerous is what happened late in the fight when Duvall got caught with a big shot at the end of one of the rounds, you know, you give the guy a chance to knock you out. So it's not a good strategy to let the guy hang around and say that's safer because especially with a puncher like Joe Smith, you know, you, you, if you can get him out of there, get him out of there. And that's really my only complaint. I mean, I, I think, um, Bivol definitely could end up being the best guy in the world. I, you know, I like the stick. I like Kovalev. I, I think both of those guys do have some flaws though. Not that Bivol doesn't, but I don't accept either that some people are just saying, well, you know, I think this shows that, you know, Gavad sticks better or you know, that Kovalev's better. No, it really doesn't. Um, I think that's still to be determined that it's hard to make a definitive call out of those guys, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if Bavall comes out on top. Of course, that's entirely theoret- th- theoretical when we've got him with the zone and Gavad stick fighting on ESPN and then Kovalev fighting on ESPN, but you know, should, should all these guys ever end up fighting? And for Joe Smith, um, I think lasting 12 with Paval is not a bad thing. Uh, with his lack of amateur experience, you know, he got some New York Golden Gloves novice experience. Um, but you know, Callum Johnson would be a good fight, like we were saying, and Mike, like you were saying. Um, both big appear to be big punchers. Uh, both just fought on the zone. Uh, Hearn can obviously make that happen. Let's do that. I, I think that would establish either of those two guys then at least solidly maintaining a position in the bottom part of the top 10 of a very tough light heavyweight division and makes the fight worthwhile because it'd be an action fight too. All right. I, I wanted your opinion, John, on what was the guy's name, Jeremiah? I texted it to you. Uh, Israel Madrioff. Did you see him last night? Yeah, I mean, uh, big big power, you know, level of opposition, nothing that you could tell anything from. But, uh, yeah, but in his second fight, you know, the level of opposition wasn't that bad. If it would have been his tenth fight, he, then yeah, but the guy had a little experience and the guy could punch a little bit at least. 
We've seen worse. But no, but no being we've, fair seen, to him, we've seen worse in world title fights, John. Oh, yeah, it's that bad nowadays, sure. But, I mean, it's just that, you know, no, no real threat to get resistance. But I do look at that level the way he took the guy out. Um, that's all you can, and, and that was impressive, and you look for things like that. So uh, when you take a guy out like that in your second fight, you're, pass, you're passing your test in boxing 2019 with what they're putting in with you. So that that was definitely passing the test, uh, scoring a knockout like that. So, you know, he he uh, he, he lives up to the hype to, 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 to the next fight, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how he keeps developing. But that was uh, what you want to do at that point. All right, Jeremiah. What yeah, do you think I, I would him? just say, you know, I, I thought he was explosive. I, I thought he was dynamic. I mean, I like what I saw out of him. Uh, what I will say is, I, I've heard that he they plan on getting him a a you know a trinket fight in uh, in less than ten fights. So you know, this kid and, and his management team have high ambitions, and I, I like what these guys are doing, man. These guys from former Soviet bloc countries. They're not messing around, man. If, if you if you're holding on to your trinket, you know, just just make sure you guard you guard that thing closely because uh, the, the Russians are coming, man. I, I mean, they're all not, they're all not Russians, of course, but uh, they come from that <laughs> yeah, Russian school of boxing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, dude, a lot of these guys look serious business, and uh, you know, they're this, just steadily popular. That's what stood out to me, and he looked like he had all kind of skill to go with it, also. Yeah, he blasted that guy. I, I mean, just just wiped him out. I mean, I, I, I he didn't mess around, and a lot of these guys are not. I mean, I I just like it. I, I like that. I just like how they're not messing around. I mean, it, all these Americans, and, and some of them are, are more justifiable, right? I mean, you got to take it on a case by case basis. Even guys who have long amateur backgrounds are not always going to be well suited to the professional style quickly. You know, it, a lot of times it's just a styles thing, but. These Russian guys, they're, they're just, they're not dicking around, man. They, they just want to get right to it. You know, and, and like the, the prospect I, I spotlighted, he, he said, you know, like, hey, I, I want to be best around with these low-level guys. I mean, I was fighting in the World Amateur Championships and the Olympics, and, and all just about all of these guys feel the same way. You know, why am I going to have a bunch of fod- fodder to pad my record when I know I can compete with these guys? And uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but there, there was another fighter uh, who fought last night, and it was later than all the other fights, who had a long amateur background, too. And, and he, he's of that opinion as well. So I, I, I like what I see in these guys. Well, go ahead and talk about it. Well, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, Terrace, uh, Ter- I know uh, John's familiar with him, but Terrace Shellstook uh, also fought on yeah. a Thompson boxing card. From, uh, and, he, he, you know, he's been inactive because of management problems, and I guess he had an injury prior to that. But, you know, he's one of those guys who... Uh, uh, did really well in the the Olympic Games that uh, you know Lamachenko and Usyk and Brinchik and I think Gavrinchenko were in or maybe maybe I'm wrong about that one, but yeah he, he's one of those guys too that he, he's got good feet he doesn't look like a puncher unfortunately you know he he does slap a little bit sometimes but he, he's sharp I mean he's good he's got good timing he's quick you know he's got a good jab so again you know they're they're moving all these guys pretty quickly and it, it's just going to be an interesting few years. All right. Well, yeah, if there's one thing, I know I just want to, do want to add on that because it fits with some fights we were just talking about and, and goes into recently and last night. Yeah, I, I think that has happened, and those guys had long amateur backgrounds. You know, we saw Stan Ionis, who I think is one of the top prospects in boxing, and Jeremiah just interviewed him. Uh, he fought very well last night. He stepped it up tough very quickly. But I think it's spreading now, which I've been an advocate for a long time of let's get rid of the no-hoper fights. That's a myth that boxing needs that for the young guys. You, now you had a Jogba who didn't have a real he, – he started boxing when he was 17, but he's at least stepping it up a little bit now already with less than 10 fights. Teofimo Lopez stepped it up a lot. He's got, what, 12 fights. Shakur Stevenson started stepping it up. Uh, you know, he's only got a, what, a little over 10 fights. That's what we need. We don't need all this extended no hoper stuff where if there's ever any hope of a casual fan turning in, we got these guys who are supposed to be the big up and comers against guys that are just falling down. I mean, even a casual fan who's flipping channels can tell that. So um, I think that that's it's an, one of the few encouraging signs we're seeing, and I think it needs to spread throughout boxing. 
All right, next up, Sean Porter defended his WBC World Welterweight title with a split decision verdict or Ugas. Um, was I, I don't think the decision was a robbery. I had Ugas win in a fight. I just think, once again, we get one guy so far out in left field, it just doesn't make it look good, John. 117-111 for Porter, I think, was pushing it, to say the least. Yeah, and one guy had a big spread for Ugas. It was a fight that could have gone either way. I thought Porter edged it, but I wouldn't argue with anybody that thought Ugas won or had well, it a draw. My, my thing about it was this. I think that Ugas fought the fight he wanted to fight. And he forced Porter to fight the fight he wanted to fight, if that makes any sense to you. And I didn't understand why Porter just, you know, didn't go get in a grill and try to bang his body. Well, I think that I did mention on our sh- our show last week that, you know, I noticed that in the, the Danny Garcia fight. And I said I thought that Porter would do that, that he started to go back to his boxing. You know, he had an amateur pedigree and he started to box more. He hadn't been doing that at all started doing it against Danny Garcia, but he was switching back and forth from the old Porter against Garcia, and that was pretty effective. I thought that fight could have gone either way, too, but I didn't argue with Porter getting the decision. But what I thought more last night was the flaw that Porter took what he did against Garcia and decided he was going to be boxing Sean Porter for 12 rounds and never right got up at his grill, like you said, Mike, and tried to make it a rough fight and really push him. I, I thought Ugas also reverted back to his bad tendencies when he had picked up a couple of close losses and then took the long layoff uh, where he's not being aggressive enough. When he had got on this run, he had started to be more aggressive. I didn't see that last night. I thought both guys underperformed. It wasn't a bad fight and it was a close fight, but I actually thought, and these are two guys that I've seen a lot of. So I always feel even more comfortable when I've really seen a lot of each guy live, you know, not watching them on tape, seeing them fight live, seeing both of these guys live, live a lot. I thought they both have had a lot better fights. Um, and I think at Sean Porter's age, I don't think that this is something that's temporary. I think that there's something yeah. in him. I don't know if it's mental or the age that, you know, he's just decided he's got to box more and he's not as effective that way, but, I'm not sure we're going to see a big change from here on out. And and Ugas, I think he'll get some other relatively big fights, even though he's a difficult opponent. And he might be the type of guy that keeps falling short like this in those kind of fights. Yeah, and I think Porter, I think may have seen his better days too, Jeremiah. I mean, he's been in, I mean, and he's a guy that we can't bitch and say that he hasn't went after the best competition. But after a while, that takes its toll also. Yeah, it does. Well, and I think, you know, what also might take its toll is, you know, things that happened before the fight even yeah. commenced. Uh, I mean, he, he didn't make weight. He, he came in, you know, a, a sizable amount over, you know, it, it came down to him cutting his hair, to, you know, to, to, to finally, you know, get the green light and get, get the go ahead. So, you know, stuff like that, what that may indicate is that he might not be a welterweight anymore. And, and for a guy... You know, he's not a small guy, I, I suppose, physically, right? I mean, this is a guy who played linebacker in high school or something, and, you know, he used to be, uh, you know, bigger, and, you know, and so he's gotten a boxing shape. But if he's, you know, he because was a middleweight of how in the amateurs, short, sorry, just throw that in there, he was, he was a middleweight in the amateurs. Yeah, right. I, I think he was, what's that, 165. And, yeah. uh, you know, so as short as he is, um, and, you know, him having to move up to 154 you know, potentially, I just don't think that bodes well for him, especially guys with, you know, taller, bigger guys up there like, uh, you know, it's Harlo or Charlo, you know, Hurd, et cetera. I, I, I just, you know, that might, you know, just be kind of, kind of the final stamp in his career. I mean, he's going to get solid fights just because of who he has backing him financially, but uh, yeah, it, it might be one of those things, you know, and I know what they're trying to do is they're trying to set him up with Keith Thurman. I mean, that, that's been in talks for, for quite a while now. And, you know, Thurman after watching that is probably doesn't have a whole lot of reason to be concerned. I mean, I know Keith Thurman had his, his Rocky patches in his last fight as well. And, you know, it, it might be the, the case that he's also passed his best. You know, it, it's hard to tell when guys take off a long period of time, uh, you know, whether they have it mentally is, 
it's hard to decipher. But I think after watching that, Keith Thurman is probably pretty confident that he can beat Porter again. I mean, you know, in the first fight, I, I thought Thurman beat him pretty, you know, clear enough in the first fight too. You know, I didn't think it was that close. Uh, th- that's not to say that there weren't close rounds. It, I just felt like it was a kind of the same way fight, I did. But you knew who won. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I I don't know if I saw anybody who scored it for Porter, but you know I didn't really check the scorecards. I thought I thought it was clear enough. But you know that that's what's going to happen, right? You're going to get Thurman and Porter in a rematch. And again, I can deal with it so long as you, you know you're feeding Spence guys that who are you know I, I suppose I can deal with uh, you know Mikey Garcia and whatnot. But so long as the winner of that fight fights Spence in a timely fashion. I can deal with, but with, I can deal with it. But unfortunately, you, know, you just never know with the sport of boxing. But I was like you, Mike. I mean, I, I thought Ugas won the fight. I thought it was a, 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 a kind of a will thing where you know he seemed to be dictating uh, the pace and the tempo and the distance a bit better. And uh, and you know when you look at the you know social media afterwards, I mean the only cries of robbery really came from the people who thought Ugas won. So to me, like to me, it felt like the average scorecard was probably about seven to five for Ugas, and it, I think that was I think that was correct. I, I think he did deserve the victory, but like a lot of people, and I don't want to make it about nationality so much, but I just you know it just seems like you know a Cuban or or a, you know a, a Russian or whatnot, they're just they don't feel likely to get those close decisions. And again, if you have Thurman and Porter two on tap, you know. Why would he, I guess? Well, I think what's the chances you get Ugas and Porter to? I don't think you will because I don't see why Porter would want those problems again. But it, it's, hard to, it's hard to, in boxing, as we all know, to predict. But I think I've got the, the vibes of how PBC sees this. And I think it's a dominoes thing. That's why it's a little complicated. But I think I know what they want to do and based on what their guys would prefer, except it has to fall a certain way for it to be what Porter probably wants. But this is what I think they're going to do. If Garcia upsets Spence, I think Pacquiao wants him. Then he figures he's a smaller guy he can take on at welterweight, and that would be a big money fight. If it happens the way we think it's going to happen, and or I don't know what everybody thinks, what I think is going to happen. I mean, if Spence beats Garcia, I think that then – you're, then Thurman might be forced to fight. And then, then I think, I think if I think if Garcia, I mean, I think if Spence beats Garcia, then I think it'll be Pacquiao and Thurman. And I think that Thurman's camp wants that fight, and Pacquiao would take that because I don't think Pacquiao is going to want Spence in that situation. I think then in that situation, which is the more likely situation, Porter's going to be the odd man out, and then I think that. PBC and Heyman are going to say, hey, Sean, it's been a good run. You're going to be sacrificed to Errol Spitz at this point. You know, we'll give you a nice payday. Uh, you, like you guys said, and I agree, you may have seen better days, and you're just going to have to take one for the team here and get a nice payday. I think, though, if Spence would get upset, then with the domino effect, you might get Thurman Porter, too. But they were mentioned a little bit the Ugas Porter. I don't see where that really fits, but again, this is boxing. Who knows? But that's the way I see that all playing out. All right, guys. We are going to take a commercial break for one minute and 12 seconds. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. So John and Jeremiah knew how long they had to go pee. And we will come back and we will preview the upcoming weekend's fights, including the aforementioned Garcia Spence fight. We will be back right after this. Hi, I'm Mike Goodpasser from the Grueling Truth Sports Network, and I'm here with just one simple message. If you're watching the games, it's time to start making money. The Grueling Truth has recently partnered with MyBookie.ag, an industry-leading sportsbook website, who reminds you that where you bet is just as important as who you're betting on. And that's why the Grueling Truth urges you to check out MyBookie.ag. In addition to the usual thousands of odds, money lines, proposition bets, and futures offered on MyBookie.ag daily, they also have in-game live betting and a mobile site that makes wagering on the go easier than ever. So join now and MyBookie will give you up to a free $1,000 cash bonus on your first deposit. Just enter promo code TGT50. 
That's TGT50 to take advantage of this offer. You can also go to thegrillingtruth.net, click the banner at the top of the page for mybookie.ag, and also get the same benefit and the same $1,000 free cash bonus on your first deposit. So visit mybookie.ag, courtesy of the grueling truth, and enjoy winning today. Mybookie.ag, you play, you win, you get paid. All right, guys, we're back on Inside Boxing Weekly. I'm Mike Goodpaster with Jeremiah Pricer and John Einreinhofer. And now it's time to look at the fights coming up this next weekend. And we're going to start off with Sunday at Madison Square Garden Theater, Luis Colazzo versus Samuel Vargas. Um, how excited are you about this, Jeremiah? Uh, I'm so excited I can barely talk about it. I mean, it's it's just, you know, belies belief that they actually made a fight of this caliber. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, it's all right. I mean, I, I actually like Colazzo. I think he's a good veteran. He's crafty. He's given some, some good fighters yeah. some stiff tests. I mean, dating all the way back to Ricky Hatton's jump to 147. I mean, a, a number of people thought that he beat Hatton. I mean, I like him. I, you know, he's, he's again, he's one of those guys who also gets by on his smarts just not pure talent. And, you know, I like what he's done in recent years, too. He's, he's been upsetting some prospects, and he's not going away quietly. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I think Vargas is all right. I mean, he's been uh, sacrificed a few times for some of the PBC guys. So, I, you know, I think Colazzo has enough to get by him pretty clearly. And, you know, there might be a few fireworks, because Vargas is a, a bit of a fighter. But I expect Colazzo to, to win a pretty clear decision here. And, uh, you know, it's... It, tough to see where he goes in the future but it seems like tbc has enough old welterweights that they could put on some decent fights maybe you get uh you know birdo again or something right uh, that wouldn't be half yeah. bad really it wouldn't come on i don't want to watch andre birdo fight anybody um john it's your fault we're talking about this because you said it was worth it talk about it <laughs> well just because of what jeremiah said about Colazzo, you know whenever I thought he was out of it, and everybody else did. Uh, you know, he, he beat Sammy Vasquez by knockout, and then he beat Bryant Perella. Um, the guys and the, and the fights were were entertaining. So you know, he, he just had a little bit of inactivity. He's complained a little bit about that, but now he's he's got some action. But the guy's fighting good. I mean, even though he's a uh, Walter Weight in his later thirties, he's fighting good. So, and then Vargas was like Jeremiah said. You know, despite his record on paper you know, just with the wins and losses looks pretty good, but uh, not who he's ever beaten. But then, you know, for what it's worth, he, he knocked, he dropped Samir Khan uh, and now Khan's fighting Crawford. So, you know, when you get Vargas now coming off a, a loss, but dropping Khan and, and Colazzo coming off some good wins, uh, you know, it, it has at least slight significance. Uh, nobody's jumping right to mine, but, Maybe what would be more interesting for Colazzo, since he's been fighting good, it, it's tough for him, but still would be interesting, is if, if there are any young up-and-coming welterweights that PBC uh, has that uh, they want to test. Uh, you know, Colazzo is obviously your guy because it, he, he's going to come with resistance, and if, if you get by him, it really does mean something. So, you know, that's, I think Colazzo should win this, but uh, that's, that's kind of uh, the significance of this fight. All right, so St. Patrick's Day is coming, and the way I know that is this. Michael Conlon is headlining that card. Um, John, any thoughts on Michael Conlon? I mean, Conlon, you know, Conlon's decent. You know, he hasn't stepped it up or anything yet. Um, I think I can touch with you on the marketing part of it. Um, with with the history of boxing, you know, uh, regarding St. Patrick's Day and, and Irish Americans and Irish in boxing, I was a little disappointed that they didn't do more. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that, that kind of frustrates you in modern boxing uh, with promotions. You had, you know, Joe Smith Jr., an Irish American from New York, fighting uh, last night, not St. Patrick's Day weekend, Shawnee Monaghan, an Irish American guy. There from you go. You got a card uh, right there. <laughs> yeah, you had a card. Well, it really did frustrate me. You had a card right there, and you have it the week in New York, the week before St. Patrick's Day. I, I, I mean, so you know, they got Conlon in there, and Katie Taylor, I think, fighting. Is she yeah. fighting Saturday night as yeah, well? Yeah, she's fighting yeah, Saturday so. night as well. 
Yeah, they, they got they got some of it in there, but uh, heck, you, boxing's got to go with what it can. I thought there was an op- there was opportunities to do more, so uh, better than nothing. I think try, try to try to use what you can, but Katie Taylor and and uh, Michael Conlon are not in tough, so um, hmm. no no suspense. You know what? There. You think maybe it would have been tougher for Michael Conlon, Michael Conlon if he was fighting Katie Taylor. I wouldn't shock me at all if she has some skills. So she has hands, <laughs> she has good skills. So um, you know, we we certainly seen a lot worse, no, no doubt about it, uh, at, uh, in the men's game. So uh, yeah, she's 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 definitely got some skills. Um, you know, it's, it's for her, it's probably hard for them to find her decent opposition. Um, but you know, Con- Conlon might have to start stepping it up a bit. I mean, Stevenson's been stepping it up. So, well, Ruba Garcia Hernandez is better than most of the guys fought, isn't it? I mean, he had yeah. a decision loss to Nonito Donaire, so it's not like he totally sucks. He just sucks a little. <laughs> just it's, it's not. It's not just saying we're not. We're not going to have it. I'm thinking like you know, like what I'd like to see, you know, we're not going to have some memorable St. Patrick's Day weekend wars or something like that. Yeah, you know, that it's was, not uh, going to be the St. Patrick's Day massacre or anything. Right, Jeremiah. right, exactly. <laughs> something that people are going to be talking about for a while. Jeremiah, what do you think? And actually, Katie Taylor, for some reason, is fighting in Philadelphia on the Tevin Farmer undercard on Friday night on the zone. Right, that's the thing. Yeah. Not, not being fully utilized. Yeah, you got to put all the Irish yeah. people on the same Irish card, Jeremiah. Right. No, I know, but you know, we we know how this goes in boxing. One's an ESPN thing, and one's yeah. a, a zone <laughs> thing. So here we go again. I mean, and and I want to make this point clear because I, you know I think I do in the past, you know, and I just feel like reiterating this. Okay, if you had a governing body or a league or whatnot. You could get these sort of things. You could maximize your your revenue on holidays like this. You could put Katie Taylor under Michael Conlon, and and you know you could add Joe Smith, and and you could even have Joe Smith, you know, beat up shot, you know, Monahan or whatever, right? I mean, just right. for the sake of it, right? You, you, you just you got to learn to play these things, and when you have this fractured sport, and you have. Uh, you know, again, these these guys playing at different times against one another to maximize their own uh, revenue and pad their own wallets. This is what we've got to deal with and, and talk about. You know, but I will say, you know, like you, like you mentioned, Mike, this is a better opponent than Conlon has fought in the past. This is a guy with some staying power. I mean, I think he lasted uh, uh, what was it seven seven rounds against Cavalero, who was pretty good. Uh, he went the distance with Nonito Donaire, who is still pretty good. You know, so the guy does have some staying power, but he doesn't have – he can't crack. You know, so that's the, the safe, the safety valve. Yep. You know, a lot of these guys – and when, when you have a guy like Michael Conlon, you're, you're going to milk him for all he's worth. I'm not that impressed with Conlon. No. I think he's a good fighter. I think if you manage him right, he might, you know, get in the top ten – I mean, this day and age, you can even maneuver him into a title shot, especially especially if you're Bob Arum. But he's not – he doesn't really light him up. He, he's not that good of a puncher. He's got good boxing skills, but he's not really that quick. His feet aren't that fast. You know, he's just not lighting it up for me. And, I, you know, I, don't, I, I think he's a, a solid prospect, but nothing special there. Well, don't you think they should be fighting for the Shamrock belt this weekend? But yeah, the, the what? Where is this at? Is this in New York again? The New York. Yeah, there should uh, be a State Shamrock, Shamrock belt. belt or something. Come on, it's, it's the WBC be can make the WBC could certainly make one up for it. Yeah, and then if the other guy wins, we'll just change it into whatever. All right, next up, pay per view on the seventy five dollar Garcia Spence. We've got Jay Leon Love against David Benavides. Um, I don't even know much what to say here. I didn't even know Jay Leon Love was still fighting, Jeremiah. <laughs> no, I'm actually excited about this fight. I'm not going to lie, and it's it's not because uh, it's not because it's a good style. Because you want to get him knocked out. Benav- yeah, yeah, it's gonna yeah, right. Benavides is going to go out there and whip Love's butt, and, and so yeah, I'm excited about that part. I mean, Benavides to me is is arguably the most talented guy 
at 168. I, I just want to see him back, get back into the mix of things. I mean, yeah, he's, he's snorting a little, you know, white powder and whatnot. But, I mean, the dude's just still talented. And I, I think he, he probably beats anybody else at 168. So I, I just like to see him back in the thick of things. And Jay Leon Love, because, uh, you know, t- typically these guys may win promotions. It's not that I dislike them necessarily, but Mayweather is not doing a good job with a lot of these guys' career. And, again, you just got to kind of sacrifice your God, make whatever money you can at this point. And that's what Jay Leon Love represents. So he's going to go get his butt whooped, and that, that's all there is to it. Yeah, and, I mean, the other thing about it is he just recently lost to Peter Quillen, too, John. So I don't hold out much hope for him. I think this is a blowout. I, I don't like this undercard. Yeah, I like Spence Garcia. Um, that's two real fighters, so to speak, to me that you want to see. Yeah. You were both it's undefeated. Two of the top but ten I don't, but, pound for pound fighters in the world, no matter which. Right, do. right. But I don't like this undercard. I, I think even with that kind of a fight, I know the way they've been doing it for years now. But I still think seventy five dollars. You know, give give the fans some undercard. You know, have faith that you're going to expose. Uh, the fans to a good fight and, and that, that, you know, you're going to have two fighters maybe that advance in the future and, and uh, have better selling power. You know, here we're doing it with Benavides. What I get to there is I'm with Jeremiah. I've been high on Benavides. I still am despite the little cocaine detour he had. Uh, he's a young guy. Um, but but Jay Leon Love. Yeah, Jay, Jay Leon. <laughs> Jay Leon Love. You know, John just agreed pro- to having a cocaine problem at one point in his life. But go ahead, John. <laughs> no, I, I, He's like I, my pre-lawyer I mean, yeah. days. Doesn't yeah. mean that every, every young no, not me, but doesn't mean that every young person has to have that detour. But uh, Benavides, you know, he, he's not an old uh, guy. What he's like, uh, you know, in his early twenties. Um, but Jay Leon Love just did not perform against Peter Quillen. It wasn't just a loss. He, he didn't want to engage. And I, I'm disappointed with PBC putting Jay Leon Love in this one on this this high it's profile. It's better than the first two fights, which is showing up to me. I'm hoping that I'm not reading this right. As Chris Ariola and Charles Martin not fighting each other, but fighting two other guys. Yeah, I'm disappointed in that too because I, I think Jay Leon Love didn't engage against Benavides, and and he's either going to just not engage again and and just try to stay away for twelve awful rounds, but I think that Benavides will let him out of there, but Prince Charles Martin, I, I also think that's a missed opportunity because Prince Charles Martin had redemption against Konatsky, and now to me, he's interesting, and I was kind of looking forward to the next time he was going to fight. He lost a war with Konatsky, and it was a close fight, and uh, came down probably to the, the final round, and now you know he's in with some 37-year-old guy who hasn't fought anybody, and, and again, on a, on a high profile undercard spot. I mean, this to me would be the time to put Prince Charles Martin against somebody else. Good. And, uh, you know, put it on this undercard. I mean, uh, and it's just, it's just not happening. I just think there's some, some missed opportunities there because by all looks, this guy, he's fighting is a no hoper. So, uh, you know, it's another wasted undercard slot. But if we save it, then maybe someday he can get a title shot at one or the three other champions because, they're running out of people to fight since we split off into three factions. Uh, Prince Charles Martin will probably get another shot at some point. I think you make a good point with that three factions things. I think certain guys do have even more value than they had in the past. And yeah, I think so don't you think that true. maybe his guys are just saying, well, maybe we'll just chill out for a while and we'll get a shot? Well, call me naive, but the way I like to look at it is like, you know, if you would do something theoretically, like let's say that um, Brazil was going to fight, you know, Prince Charles Martin. And then, you know, one of the two guys emerges, maybe it's just a good fight. And they both fight well, um, even though you got to have a loser and us as a draw. And then, you know, that guy looks like a better opponent for, you know, the quote unquote title alphabet title shot that comes up after that. that that's to me, that's just a little more creative ways of doing these things that they're, that they're not doing. And who knows? Maybe Gregory Corbin's pretty good. He's fifteen and zero with nine knockouts. He's not forty yet. He's only thirty eight. And Boxrec, <laughs> Boxrec has him ranked one hundred and ninety two out of the heavyweights. I mean, he did beat Homero Fonseca, who was fourteen and eight in his last fight. So, stranger things. Have Upset happened. alert. 
You never know. Yeah. You never know. I mean, it could yeah. happen. It could uh, happen. We'll I, I just think this opportunity. Friday, Jeremiah. All right. Um, and I don't know why Chris Ariel is fighting. Um, next up, let's just go to the main events. We can cut to shit and quit talking about stuff nobody cares about. Mikey Garcia versus Errol Spence. What's your take on this, John? And does Mikey have a chance? Um, I think he, I, I have to say he's got a chance just because he, he's so good. That um, makes this fight better on, than every fight we see. <laughs> right, right. And that's what makes it interesting. And, you know, you do want to see this fight. It's got, it's got intrigue and intrigue matters, you know, competitiveness and intrigue are the two things that matter. And this could have both, but at the least it's got intrigue. Um, I think, you know, Mike, Mikey Garcia is that good. Uh, he's definitely challenging himself. You got to give him credit. Um, I, 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 th- I think this one won't come only, even though I think that highly of Garcia, I, I don't think it'll only come down to the weight. Like a lot of people are analyzing it. I think it's going to come down to a, some percentage of the weight, but then a percentage that I just think Errol Spence is that good. And I think you're going to have two guys that are really good, but I, I don't think Garcia is any better than Spence, uh, talent wise even though I think they're both very good. And then I think when you put the weight on top of that, that I think Errol Spence will have too much for, for him. I think Garcia is probably too good for Errol Spence to just take him right out of there in the first couple of rounds. But I think when you get to the middle of the fight, I think, you know, Spence being a, a, a Southpaw who's got boxing skills and speed and the punching power and is aggressive and Mikey Garcia being talented in all aspects, but he's not, He's a defensively sound boxer, but he's not an elusive boxer. In other words, he's going to be there. Spence isn't going to have to catch him. And I think that'll probably be his undoing starting in around the, the middle rounds. And probably just as we start getting into the second half of the fight, I think Spence is going to be able to get him out of there. All right. Um, what do you think, Jeremiah? Because the way I look at this is this, and it's the same thing I've stuck with. I'm not convinced on Spence because I haven't really seen him do anything that impressive against somebody I thought was really good. Um, Kel Brook was not a one-sided ass whip until the end of that fight, Jeremiah. So I give Garcia a chance just because I'm not really sure about Spence. But what I think I may be sure about is this. I think this is going to be a very compelling fight, and I think these two guys are going to stand there and fight each other. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that could be the case. I mean, you know, when John was talking about how, you know, Garcia is not particularly elusive, he is right. You know, Garcia is not the kind of guy, because of his punching power, he's not the kind of guy who's going to circle you all night long. I mean, he's usually able to dictate because of his power. You know, he. Yeah, he'll, he'll stand in the middle of the ring and he'll about to, you know, jab behind his, or sorry, box behind his jab and, you know, look for the right hand. And, you know, even at 140 pounds, he showed that he has some power. Uh, I don't think it's going to carry up that well no. at 147. Again, I, I didn't think he was that big of a puncher at 140, uh, you know, again, against Lippinets. And, and, you know, we also got to mention that these guys are not actually 140 pounds, you know, when they're in the ring. I mean, a guy like Lippinitz is, you know, who's naturally a little bit bigger, you know, is probably, I don't even know if they had a post-fight or a post-weigh-in uh, weight for him, but, you know, he's probably in the 150s or so. So, again, I, I, I do disagree with John in the sense that right at this moment, I do think Mikey Garcia is the better talent of the two, you know, until... Just from me, what I just we've seen, a little... that can change on Saturday yeah, I, night. Yeah. Yeah, it very well could have. And it's, again, it's not that I don't think Spence is a good fighter. I just need to see a little bit more out of him. And of course, you know, it's not like Mikey Garcia is beating a lot of top talent either. You know, he has jumped, he has jumped from division to division, and there, there is something wanting in his resume. And, you know, you got to credit him for taking on this, this level of competition. I mean, he didn't need to do this. I mean, he, he's pretty much been calling his own shots since he left top rank. And again, he didn't need to take on this sort of challenge, but I guess. You know, from what I've heard, they think they see something in Errol Spence's game that they can exploit, and who knows? They may be right. I mean, Spence is also a guy, I think more so, you know, is, is a guy that you don't need to go looking for. He's a guy who's going to come to you. He is a southpaw. 
defensively, he's good. He's not great. I mean, you can touch him. There's something about, you know, the Cal Brook fight that you did see. I mean, Brook was able to land right hands from time to time. The problem was, he, I didn't think he was putting a lot of mustard on him. You know, Garcia, I think, is you know, just as, about as sharp as you get technically. So maybe Garcia sees that. Maybe he says, okay, well, the, the, the biggest problem for a southpaw typically is a good right hand. Garcia has a very good right hand. You know, Spence, again, he's not defensively great, uh, you know, and, and maybe Garcia thinks that he can out-jab him and maybe he thinks he can be a bit quicker. That, that's What I'm hoping is that Garcia actually comes in a little bit lighter so he can main, you know, worry about his, his speed more so than his physicality because I, I don't think, you know, if he goes head-to-head with Errol Spence, I don't, I don't think that's a good game plan. I, I think he'd be better off, you know, focusing on his speed more so than power. And, uh, I mean, he could be right. I mean, there might be a little bit more fighting than, than we see. Uh, you know, I do think Spence eventually breaks him down and gets him out of there. And it is compelling for these reasons. I, I do see a lot of people who are saying, you know, Garcia is going to get run over. It's not going to be a competitive fight. And I, I just I have a hard time seeing that just because I think Garcia is that good. I mean, when you when you look at a traditional weight class jump of of one thirty five to one forty seven, most guys in history are they're not going to make that jump right successfully. You, you know, at the highest of levels, and and this is sort of one of those fights. But you know, just because Garcia is, is so sharp technically, and I, I think you know defensively responsible. I do think there are go, there are go, it is going to be compelling. There are going to be a lot of interesting moments in this fight, and I I, I don't think Spence runs him over. I I mean uh, it, it's not outside the realm of possibility, right? Maybe Garcia just is too small. Maybe his power doesn't carry up very well, and Spence just walks right through him and then breaks him down and you know bangs the body like a drum and gets him out of there sooner than we think. I mean, you know, Mikey Garcia has taken punches to me, fairly well since he got dropped against Roman Martinez. So, you know, the chin issues uh, I have, have kind of softened, in my opinion. But it is an interesting fight. It does kind of suck, though, that we're, you know, already three-plus months into the year, and this is, you know, clearly the most compelling fight of the year. Well, the good thing is this, John. I mean, we don't have to worry about it. We could go ahead and pay for this one because I don't think either one of us wants to pay for the next two pay-per-views. <laughs> No, that, that I mean, if you want to, the, the only I don't I don't like the seventy five dollar pay per view being back, but but it's more caliber with interesting yeah. fights like well, this. Well, it's better than having Terrence Crawford and Amir Khan or Dominic Brazil against Deontay Wilder, which both of those fights should be on network television. Right. They should be, and and exactly, and 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 the one thing with the pay per view, at least, right? It's it's not a. It's not a subscription. You get to pick and choose which ones you want to get. I mean, uh, you know, to me, right? I mean, I don't think Wilder Brazil should be pay per view, and I don't think I, I don't think Crawford Con is even a sellable pay per view. No. I think that's dead on arrival. It's going to get go. You know what? I think that's Fox. less competitive than Wilder and Brazil because at least with the heavyweights, maybe Brazil can get lucky and land a shot. Yeah, at least because Brazil can punch. Yeah, and uh, you, you got uh, you know. Con and, Con and Crawford, there's just no rhyme or reason to it. And plus, it's going up against Garcia and Granados on Fox for free. I mean, what person at the right behind in the United States is going to pay for Crawford Cup? I mean, how many people in the right mind are going to watch Garcia and Granados for free? <laughs> yeah, that's that's not a great, I mean, to me, that's not a great fight either. I agree, but, but no. hey, it's free. Well, it's you free. know what? Yeah. Granados, you know, is at least going to come out and give his best effort. And yeah, you know, he'll try. Garcia doesn't throw a lot of punches, but we all know in the end, even if Garcia doesn't throw a punch, he ain't losing that fight. Yeah, he'll he'll do he'll do enough. But well, at least we got a good fight. At least we got a good fight that's interesting coming up this weekend. It's nice for boxing to have an interesting fight. I mean, that's what we want. Yeah. And the good thing is they yeah, do the like- week before the NCAA tournament. Right, and that's by design. So yeah. that that is good planning there. Oh, righty. Jeremiah, what would, did you have something to say? No, I'm just, I'm happy, you know, just with the way things are run, obviously, that, you know, three months in where we're finally getting something. I mean, it, you know, regardless of the date, I'm, you know, I'm just happy that, no, I mean, it, it's just kind of nice that, you know, we are finally getting something to look forward to. 
been a pretty uh, drab affair so far. And, uh, you know, besides Canelo, what Canelo Alvarez is doing this year, it's not shaping up to be a whole lot of optimism. All right, how about this? What about this for optimism? Eddie Hearn says he's going to be offering Tank Davis a massive payday of $5 million to fight Tevin Farmer. They should make that fight. They really should. I mean, uh, you know, we had a piece about it on the website. And, you know, you're just looking at 130 pounds, and any, anybody who's familiar with their background, they've been kind of, jab, you know, jibber-jabbing back and forth for a few years now. And Farmer seems like he really wants it. I don't think Farmer would mind. I mean, you know, I don't think uh, Davis would mind. Farmer's a, a non-puncher. Uh, you know, a, a Farmer's slick. Davis is explosive. It's an interesting fight, you know, and you, you get some back and forth verbally beforehand as well. You know, we are talking about two guys who are rated in the top ten, you know, Davis being number two at this point, you know, might be number one, uh, you know, might surpass Burchelt in the future. But I, I, I think you go ahead and make it. I mean, I'd rather see Davis versus Burchelt because, again, that creates a new line. But this wouldn't be bad either. I mean, they, they might as well just go make it happen. I know, I know Davis – he may be a little risk adverse when it comes to Lomachenko, but this, this to me, is something that he can grab onto. All right, Jeremiah or John, I want to give you this one because I think this would be a very interesting fight. Um, Eddie Hearn today says in August, Dimitri Bivol will face Marcus Brown. Yeah, I don't. I mean, if if they can make that fight, that's a that's a top that's a top fight if they can make it. Um, I don't know how they pull it off but uh if it can be done that's certainly a fight i'd like to see it, it would be one of the you know one of the good fights in boxing that could be made because light heavyweight's one of the best divisions and those are two guys at the top of that division well let's face it I mean, we're not going to get that much but any fight could be made they just won't do it yeah I, there you got a pbc and a disown thing so i mean once in a while Heyman does you know, work these deals out. You have to give him that, that, that he's had a guy go over, but I don't know if he, you know, if they would do that with Brown, but uh, if, if it could be worked out, it would be a good fight. All right. Um, Jeremiah, I would hate to report that Aragon Garcia did not write anything new over the weekend. Damn it. Damn it, man. I Every also, day I look forward to I it. also would like to report that I found him on Facebook and sent him a friend request, but he has not accepted it yet. Well, he's, well, I mean, if he's listening to his podcast, you're going to get a decline. <laughs> Why? I mean, yeah, I would, no, I mean, if somebody talked like that about me, I'd love to be friends with him on Facebook. Then we could go argue. Yeah, well, that's you. I don't think it's Aragon Garcia because <laughs> that, that dude just uh, – just reading what he writes, you're not, you're not going to have a lot of ammo. Hey, and get this, you know, you, I, I don't know if John listens during the week, but by sending that friend request, I also found out that the profile picture or the cover picture on his um, Facebook page is of him and Mauricio Suleiman holding the WBC title. Hold on, you serious there? Yeah, I told you that that night. His name is like Dude. Juan something. Man, well, it's funny because, you know, just reading his articles, we were we were teasing that sort of data out of his articles, you know, before we even went there. So, you know, I mean, hell, no surprise there. I mean, the guy's so biased, it's coming out of his eyeballs. All right. John, anything else before we wrap it up? Yeah, just just a, a, I think something philosophically that people that follow boxing are going to have to think about, which is where these TV debates matter when people want to say they don't matter and you're cheering for a side. For me, it's, it's not picking a side, but it's that I think there could be legitimately you could come down on either side of this, but I think fans are going to have to decide. You know, either either you support attempts to have stuff on free TV where a lot of people are going to see it, or you are a supporter that boxing will just slip further, further, and further into a niche and be outlawed. You're going to have to pay more and more to watch it every time to the point where it's going to be at risk. I don't know when it would be, but it'll, it'll just shrivel up probably and go away. You know, there are some people I think legitimately say who, well, I don't care about that. If I see some good fights now and I'll pay for them and, and I don't want to talk to any casual fan anyway, you could take that approach or, you know, the sport could, be broader, seen by more people, 
starting with with you know free TV options like Fox and ESPN, which is basic cable. So I, I think people actually have to make up their mind. You know, if you're following the sport, you know, which side of that are you going to be on? Because it's going to go one way or the other. Jeremiah, any final closing comments? Before I render a verdict Maybe. on who was better between the two of you tonight. <laughs> Oh man, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm in the philosophical mood tonight. I mean, you know, John, John and I typically agree on all this stuff, and you know, you have, uh, you know, like I saw a post by a boxing guy who worked in the industry for many years, and you know, he said a few days ago that uh, you know him and most boxing insiders agree that the saturation of alphabet trinkets is a positive thing. You know, these guys can make money they wouldn't otherwise make, and you know, and then you know, I got a watch guys like John Scully, you'd be like, no, you're, you're, you're an idiot if you think that. And yeah, it, it, it's just one of those things that I, I, I don't know. I, it, it just, it's a common theme that a lot of people just don't look as if they can see past their nose, you know, because obviously the saturation of belts, uh, you know, the separation of, of production entities, you know, the zone and showtime and ESPN, I, I don't know if, uh, and I know a lot of boxing fans are not, you know, uh, you know, in, in it to think about these hard issues. I mean, a lot of times, you know, in places like the NFL and MLB, you know, you leave that up to corporate executive types, you know, who are meant to push the bill forward, you know, meant to captain the ship and, and you know, generate as much revenue as possible. But it's just in this sport, you know, with all the titles, all the divisions, all the, the warring factions and and I got to worry about who's the king of what fiefdom. You know, it, it's just at some point, you know, we've got to realize that a lot of this is just, it's just a roundabout, it's just roundabout bullshit. You know, it's not going to get us to a stage where, you know, things can be much easier. That's why we're always going to lag behind. And I think like John said, you know, it's just going to slip further and further into a niche sport. I mean, you're always going to have those guys who transcend it a little bit, you know, uh, you know, with the Brits picking up Joshua and some of these other guys, and you know, guys like Ricky Hatton, and you know, there will be characters who garner more attention. But again, we we've got to damn demand more, you know, more of the sport itself. Or again, like John said, you know, just swirl down the toilet bowl. All right, guys. So if you want to continue on this descent down the toilet bowl with us, you can hear me and Jeremiah Monday through Friday on <laughs> our daily show. Uh, maybe we'll get, maybe we'll see if Scully wants to come on this week. Maybe I'll give him a holler. Yeah, yeah, you should. But, and John, if you're listening, you got to come on the show. Send me a message. Then I don't have to give you a holler. All right. All right, guys. <laughs> not John Scully, not you, John. We already That's right, know John that you're, Scully. you're slipping in the former apple. middleweight, the former middleweight and light heavyweight. Right, got it. Yeah. And if it was today, he would have won. He'd probably be like a four time world champion. Sure. Yeah. Why and that's not? not to make fun of it. He was a damn good fighter. No. But nowadays, everybody gets to be a world champion. Hell, he might have a Mayan belt or an Irish belt or just a belt to wear in his pants. All right, guys. We're going to wrap the show up tomorrow. Survive in advance. We'll have Brian Ralph on from Fan Sided Busting Brackets to talk a little bracketology and to preview the conference tournaments ahead. Um, John, I don't think we'll need you to do a West Virginia show during the NCAA tournament this year. No, no, no. This year has been such a disaster. We will not be. Uh, we, we've got to win the Big 12 to make the big dance this yeah. year. So it's not yeah. looking real promising. Uh, well, maybe play in the NIT or you above 500. No. No. Okay. Losing record. Well, maybe play in the CBI then. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think this team's CBI bound, although that has shown signs of life but much, much too late in the season. All right, guys. So make sure you go to iTunes. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Whatever the hell you do on iTunes. Rate us. Tell us how great we are or how great John and Jeremiah are. Um, Help us out. Go to our Facebook page, The Grueling Truth. Give us a like there. You can follow TGTN Boxing on Twitter or just follow at Grueling Truth. So we're going to wrap the show up for tonight. I want to remind everybody to hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for John Einreinhofer, Jeremiah Pricer, 
I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.